you know, I don't measure one life by how many people come to church. I measure it by how much fruit we have. Y'all should try that sometime. It makes it, um, you know, you can have a, a thousand carnal Christians and since the goal of the kingdom life is to take your authority and spread it all around, then carnality has no authority, even though it might have attendance. And, you know, I think in this season that God is, um, he's made a promise to us. You know, I was, when I was studying yesterday, I was trying to decide, you know, well, am I going to really start the topic of temple? Because, you know, Wednesday night I want to talk about kind of something else. And I was thinking, oh, and then another day, you know, we're going to have the party. And, you know, I was just, I was trying to calculate how many days I had. That's what I do, you know. How many days do I get to preach on that? But I felt the Holy Spirit, He told me that He was going to give us a lot of latitude next year. And it, it reminded me of um, back, I remember, I know Cece was still working at um, that other place with the initials. I can't think of it right now. DPS, no, that doesn't sound right. Coyote, I don't know. IPS? IPS? No, yeah, sorry. We were DPS and up here. Department of Structure. Um, and I had listened to a series from Graham, C Graham Cook. And so the name... I don't know. Siri's trying to take over the world. Did you hear? <laughs> Did I say something that sounded like, hey, Siri? Or, oh, everybody's things. I'm go yeah, no. See, when I say it, it doesn't work. But when I say some other random word. <laughs> anyway, the name of the... The name of this series was Latitude and Indulgence. And um, I want to just start today with a couple snippets from that. And he talked about um, it's time to explore an internal freedom with him. Yes. Now, what's crazy is I don't even remember what year that was, but what year did you quit? It's probably around 2017, 16, 17, somewhere around in there. And I feel like that this prophecy that he gave back then, y'all are living it now. Wow. Thank you. And, and I just, I like to say every now and then that prophetic words that go out are not, it's hard for us to keep track of them. We're kind of like the frog in the kettle. Have you heard that one, you know, where it just is boiling, but you can't change, you can't tell the change of temperature. And he also said that real prophets love process. The process of pro prospe prospecting, prospecting and exploration. And so he so he was saying that basically for me that God's not going to just um he doesn't really want to give us the answers because part of us growing into our anointing is discovering the answers with him. Yes. You know, I've talked, I've talked about this a lot. I really love puzzles. I put a puzzle on my Christmas list. Oh, she's in, she, the girl has my name's not even in here. So never mind. Because I love that. I, it takes a lot of work. It's one of those wooden puzzles that makes a 3D image, you know, and actually moves. And it's probably this big, but on the picture it looked bigger than that. But you know how, right? It's about, it's all about perspective. Like Tessa sent me this picture of the flowers that she had yesterday. And I, when I thought, thought it was this big old bouquet like this. And when I walked in the door and I saw, I was like, perspective. I just turned them into, I said, this is about perspective today. And so I, I thought about how do we explore with God when we don't know what we're exploring for? And, you know, since God is all about people and people discovering the love of the Father, then that helps me to know how to expand my personal prospecting and exploration 
He wants me to learn more about his love for people. Yes. Right? Yes. And the other thing that he said was there was a new breed of prophetic people who will minister to the Lord. Yes. What does it mean to minister to the Lord? Yeah. Remember, we're supposed to become a drink for Jesus. He's a thirsty Savior. Yes. How many have gotten to the point where you kind of understand that worship's not all about just making you feel better? And isn't it weird that when we do things God's prescribed way, we always receive? Yes. You know, and so that's what Lynn's when we talk about in the kingdom wealth mindset is that all wealth of any kind, emotional, financial, physical, comes through giving. All emotional, physical, financial wealth and kingdom living comes through giving. And so, you know, a lot of us still have a hard time giving emotionally. What that means is that when I'm encountering you in relationship, I'm not so focused on how I feel in relationship with you. I'm more focused on how you feel in relationship with me. And see, Jesus went for, oh, some of y'all just went, Poof. Jesus went first in all these categories and he equipped you to go first. And in that process of giving away even what I need, then he multiplies what he has back to me. It's a principle of wealth mindset in the every area. Did I say physical, emotional, and financial? And so finances are, can I just say it bluntly, finances are the kindergarten version of wealth mindset. You're welcome. And so when I'm still straining with my finances to give, you know, when I'm still looking at that number, that 10% number, I'm straining then I am not entering into kingdom wealth. I'm living as a slave. I'm living under a law that, that, that I've condoned. This is what I've done. I've said, well, to keep me good with God, I've got to 10% it. That's really the words we used. To keep me good, to keep me in his good graces and make sure he's not mad at me, right? And that has nothing to do with tithing. So if you're doing that, then you're not experiencing wealth because your motive is already off. And that's what we're going to learn in the kingdom wealth mindset. I'm just still in, I haven't talked to her about what she's going to talk about, but you know, I'm sure that was part of it. But I just wanted to give a little plug for that because Wednesday and I, we're going to be doing a little more work on our, I'd like to get you to promise before you know the answers. Just because I'm good to you. I like to get you to think about next year and how far you want one life to go. You know, I'm not a multimillionaire. I would fund this whole thing if I could because, and I wouldn't care, but he gives you the privilege to participate with me. And when you do, he multiplies upon multiplication. I mean, I can tell you, you know, I've spent a lot of time with Vinton and Tessa and Aaron and Cheryl, and when I met them, you can ask them. They lived in a hovel. I mean, these kids had two cars that would hardly get them. <laughs> Do you remember when y'all drove that thing? I remember Lynn and I just prayed and prayed and prayed over them when they told us they were driving that thing to Montana, right? And I told Lynn, I said, oh, babe, I don't think they can make it there in that thing. I mean, like, that was scary. Like, as a mom, I was just like, oh, Lord, Jesus. But see... They they begin to understand, they begin to watch our lives and how generous we were, and it began to soften their heart to generosity. Listen, your heart has to be softened to the Father's generosity, otherwise you'll feel undeserving, and you'll want to work for it, and you'll be tired all the time, and you'll be controlling a bunch of stuff because you, you think it comes from works. It doesn't because you would boast. You would brag on on your business. You'd brag on your marriage. You'd brag on your giving. You know, I don't ever even look at the tithe records, what y'all give. 
I, it's not a thing with me. I don't, I mean, none of us do. Lynn wouldn't if she didn't have to deposit it, but it's not a measuring stick for anything. It's about the motive. And so, you know, as I've spent time with them, they've literally changed their entire motivations of life. That they their internal value went up. Remember that thing I sent about the imposter syndrome from Steve Backlund? Did, who all read that? When you operate in that, you can't operate in kingdom wealth. Right? Come on, I'm trying to break you free a little bit. Do you want to be free or not? Some of y'all look like stick in the muds already. Listen, this is not a message of condemning. It's a message that I'm, I'm presenting to you a truth in the word that if you live by the truth, then you can have freedom. But if you want to pick some other system, then you get to eat the fruit of its God. It's not, you know, it's not my thing. I didn't write it. Come on, Right? But I, I'm living it because, I mean, before we ever met any of y'all, I mean, Pam and I were good to people. We've been good to people before y'all even got to the planet. And so I think that, you know, I remember learning a lot of lessons way back before I even met Pam. And I just use that as a marker because y'all know her. Yeah. Right. I mean, if I talked about somebody before Pam, you wouldn't know who I was talking about. But, but... It was supposed to be funny. <laughs> but I learned a lot of things prior to that, prior to knowing her. Why? That was working stuff out of me that I see him working out in you right now. And so that's why it's cool because I had to work it out too. Everybody does. But if because we weren't raised in that way. When, when, when we begin to have children that we raise in that way, then they won't have to go through the healing you've had to go through. It's all about the way we raise our children. Otherwise, we're going to reproduce all the injuries I have, and we're just going to hope they don't need healing for it. Come on, that was good. I'm going to get my own hanky out today because last week I said that God is raising up an army that you are a part of if you want to be that is not distracted by the counterfeit. Right now on the earth there's a counterfeit. I'm telling you, even in the prophetic world, there's a counterfeit to the prosperity of God, even going on right now. And you have to remember what you believe. And you have to remember where you want to go. You know, God has placed different anointings on different prophetic people. If you're not careful, you'll listen to somebody. It happened to me yesterday. I just innocently just saw a prophet guy I know, and he started talking about some doom and gloom stuff. And I know that's not for me. Hello. Remember how we used to think, oh. So I'm not going to go back through that, right? All right. I have a couple slides, Vinton. So today I'm going to begin, what does it mean to be a temple? Um... And let's turn to a couple foundational scriptures. These will be something you should memorize, okay, as we're talking about this. Can you learn how to do that? Yes. Um, let me pull it up so I can, I can play with you. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 3.16. Now, 1 Corinthians 3 is... Uh, a complete chapter of what we're talking about right now. And actually hidden within this chapter is the word of the year, just in case you want to know. But verse 16 says, Don't you realize that together you have become God's inner sanctuary and that the Spirit of God makes His permanent home in you? Now, um, that's the Amplify. Let me read the Amplify. Do you not know and understand that you, the church, are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells permanently? What's permanent? What's the only qualification to this permanency? Receiving Jesus. 
Have you stopped receiving him? Have, has anyone just decided not Jesus for me today? No. So he's permanent. I personally like to give him a lot of room. I just, here's what I think. I think, man, God's just been so tired of not getting to be God in anyone. His whole design of humanity was for you to be a temple of him. Isn't that crazy design? Do you love that? You know, that's why, that's what we're going to be talking about, but that's why whenever he told Moses how to make the temple, that there were so many, we're going to be talking about why some rooms had different things because it's the same for you. Your, that was a shadow of your temple now, your being now. That's why we've been talking about that prior to the temple location, there's got to be a entire wall with gates so that just not everything, because the temple is the holy place. Yeah. <laughs> That's you. Yeah. You're the holy place. God. You're the you're the place where he wanted to dwell. Yeah. That's just, I mean, I can't even. And so, in in this particular chapter, though, Paul. Um, he he ten to, ten times in this one chapter he says, um, "Don't you know? Don't you realize? Don't you get it? Don't you?" Because what is he? The when someone says, "Well, don't you know?" What are they saying? Said. Yeah, this has already been said. This is a reminder. Yes. How many need reminding? Don't raise your hand. How many need <laughs> reminding? A lot. It depends on what I value. I bet no one's going to be, re if you're planning on eating after service and not and not fasting, I bet nobody has to tell you, remind you to eat after service. You're not going to go home and go, oh my gosh, I just, I just totally forgot to eat. And it's like 10 o'clock tonight, right? right? How many eat right after service? Okay, so you're going to be eating again today after service, yes. yeah. right? I don't have to say, okay, y'all, after service now, don't forget. Everybody go eat. Right? So see, that's been established by your physical man. Well, your spiritual man. You know, that's what Paul's trying to talk about. He's saying that don't live by carnality that just remembers lunch real easily but doesn't remember anything about cultivating his presence when you get home. Yeah. Right. You know, I, I think it comes down to really simple. You know, what choices am I making with my gates? Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. Yeah. You know, every gate has a potential for the enemy to come in it. I could spend, I don't have time to spend um, a lot of time on all the gates, what they were, but they had gates for everything. They had a sheep gate. A dung gate, that's where poop goes, right? They had the main gate. That's why, why, that's why everything, Bible says, open the gates and let the king of glory. Who lets him in? Otherwise, it would have said, them, them gates are open and the king's coming in. It says you, it's, a, it's an understood you. You open the gate and let, the king's waiting. He's standing outside. He's even knocking. And so me, I open the gate and let the king of glory. It's not like, I mean, in the old days, we were like, he probably don't want to come here. That's what religion said. Where the holy man, remember the holy man is the only one that could get anything. We just had all set and listen. And when he told us to do something, we just did that. We didn't even think for ourselves. We didn't realize we weren't thinking for ourselves. We, you know, Luther was the one who, you know, Martin Luther, back in the 1500s, he was the one that wrote the Bible in another language because what he wanted the people to be able to read the Bible for themselves. And the Catholic Church was what was in 
power then. It was like almost a governmental system. It wouldn't even allow people to do any of that. That's where we got that. That was They came out of the dark ages and they did that. But it was really dark before then because there wasn't the word. So we've progressed. And so now we're saying, don't you remember? That's a great way to withhold the culture of art. Wait, don't you remember? You made a promise. Don't you remember? You said you wanted to be God's servant. Don't, don't you remember? You've been bought with a price. So you don't. I woke up this morning, I stumbled to the bathroom at five, and I turned on my phone, and I was just look, going to look for something. I guess I had uh, watched something on Instagram the night before. And so the first thing that popped up was Lisa Bevere. And she was talking about how whenever they went to speak somewhere early on, that I guess John, her husband, you know, John Bevere, I guess he just called her up and gave her the microphone and told her to speak. Well, in this little clip on Instagram, she was saying, I was so mad at him and we got, and I got the mic and I said something. But when we got in the car, I said, never again do that to me. And he said, no, no, you've been bought with a price. You are not your own. What if God asked you to do something you were uncomfortable with? You think Mendel is like, loves the battle, loves the uncomfortability? You know, we, we're not our own. We don't get to choose, right? right? So that's what he's saying. Don't you realize that you are God's inner sanctuary? That the Spirit of God makes His permanent home in you. That's, that's, He's, He's giving you identity. Listen, this is really the only thing that matters. If you didn't do anything else in life but just learn how to be His temple, it would be amazing because then you would yield to the Holy Spirit. And what does the Holy Spirit do? He tells you everything to do. So he, you would never be hungry. You wouldn't ever be lonely. You would never be afraid. You would never have control. You would never have all those things that how much time do we struggle with and try to get help with? Why? You know, I don't know if Cece's going to read it, but she wrote this little word about how it's like puppet strings on us that are just teaching us to move into this motion that we don't even like. It wasn't even meant to be that way. You're the temple. Even with God, you have freedom. He's not even a puppet master. You know, I love Pam. That's why she makes people own their choices. If you say, hey, I'm going to do this, well, just own it. Yeah. Nobody's holding a gun to your head around here. Nobody, right? If, if I have guilt for my own choice, I didn't make a good choice. That's right. yeah. so what Judy was saying at the beginning of service, that don't act like the person who's just pointing out to you what you're doing is the jailer. Yeah. That's right. yes. They're just pointing out to you what you are doing, already did. Just mentioning it doesn't line up with temple work. Right. Don't get mad at them. Right. You did it. See, that's the surefire way to have no maturity. Yeah. Is to be mad at the messenger. Yeah. <laughs> have you ever had that happen? Where you told somebody something and you're like, and they, were, and they, didn't, they didn't like it. What happens? Inevitably. It repeats. Don't you love his ways? If I don't deal with the core of why I did it anyway and I get mad at someone mentioning I'm doing it and I don't change it, it will repeat. Happens a lot in jobs. You go to work somewhere. Remember when you're younger and you're an idiot? (laughs) And what happens? They loose you from your need to come in the next day. They say you're released. You don't need to come back here. Well, you're free. What was it? My choice to not honor the system that they made. See, that's what we do when we're young. We're like, I'm free. I can do whatever I want to do. I can do it anywhere I want to do it. Right? I can willy-nilly. Right? Because I'm free. But see, everything has a system. 
Even if you're an entrepreneur, you have to live underneath the system. Yes. So we would, mm, 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 if we could get it, yeah. right. I better live under God's system yeah. because all the little G systems will yeah. fail. Yeah. Yeah. So when you hear somebody prophesying, they're gloom and doom, they're prophesying about a little G system that's going to fall. Yeah. It doesn't have to touch us yeah. if we're not living under any of that system. If I had all my money in Enron, if I put all of my wealth, my emotional wealth, my, fi my financial wealth, my physical wealth in an entity that's a little G, it will fail me. Yes. So the other foundational scripture I wanted to read to you was, what is it? Yeah, 1 Corinthians 6, I have it. 19, do you not know, there it is again, that your body is a temple. These are not the same chapters. Of the Holy Spirit who is within you, whom you have received as a gift from God, that you are not your own property. Yes. Did I put it in the Passion up there? No. I'm going to read in the Passion. Have you forgotten... That your body is now the sacred temple of the spirit of holiness who lives in you. You don't belong to yourselves any longer for the gift of God, the Holy Spirit, lives inside your sanctuary. You are God's expensive. You are expensive. Yes. Have you ever bought anything expensive? Think right now about the most expensive thing that you've ever bought. We just bought a sectional. And although it's not that expensive, it's the most I've ever spent. We've been waiting on it and waiting on it and waiting on it, right? So what I do is I walk around the room and I think, and then I envision it. And I'll be like, I'll sit here and I'll sit here and I'll sit here and I'll kick my legs out here because it's one of those ones that has recliner. Uh -huh. and, right, and I just envision it. That's what God did with you. You were expensive. And he goes, mm. She's going to be over here on that day. Mm. She's going to be over here. I'm going to, I'm going to put her, my anointing on her mm, over here. Oh, and then, oh, oh, he kind of gets that Holy Spirit movement every now and then. I'm going to put my anointing on her over here. He's thinking about all the ways that he can flow through you to be used on the earth. You were expensive. It says you were God's. <laughs> you're God's expensive purchase paid for with tears of blood so by all means then use your body to bring glory to God wow that's that's quite a verse that wrecks me to think that Part of what Jesus did is that so my little being can give glory to God. So it can display to other people how good He is, not how good I am. All the good in me is Him. But I'm meant to display good. I'm meant to brag on Him. I'm meant to say, oh, I remember where I was. I remember where I was when I experienced his presence like we had here today. I remember her. I had not always had that. I didn't even know you could have it. And I went to church every day of... Every time the door was open, from, from the time I was born, I was in church. I never missed. And the, the year I spent not going to church was the year I encountered his presence. And he said, go and make a place. Even if it's just two. I used to tell him, even if it's just me and you, and we meet every Sunday, I will make a place for his presence. See, I cultivated that. I'm not saying anything 
about myself, but I was unwilling to go back to religion. I was unwilling to go back to a place where his presence wasn't even there. I remember when I met Aubrey, she would call me after service, after service at Life Church and at Victory, and she would be like, I am so miserable. On the platform with the lights and the cameras and all the people telling her, oh my gosh, you're so amazing. Oh my gosh, your voice. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And her hands were dead. Just like Pam. See, size doesn't matter. (laughs) Size doesn't matter. I've been in it. I've been in a church of 10,000, a church of 8,000. Size does not matter. The only thing that matters is His presence. And you know what? You can tell if someone's been in His presence or not. You can tell if the service is geared towards His presence or it's geared towards whatever, some sort of program. Get them in, get them out. (laughs) So we don't want to forget It's the foundation of why you need a watchman. Why you need a wall. Why you need to repair your wall of truth. Why you need to establish outside your wall those. You should tell somebody, hey, I have this anointing. And you need to be my armor bearer. If you have an anointing, you need to tell people that. Lynn and Pam are my armor bearer. Lynn in the natural, Pam in the spiritual. And I don't have to wake up every day and say, you got me? I couldn't do this without them. Because this, whether it looks like it or not, it's really weighty. It's not just a block of wood I'm standing on. And it's really, really weighty for year after year month after month, day after day, week after week, to make sure my heart is full and ready for revelation. Can't be full of the world. There's a lot of no's I have in my life. I'll buy us all movie tickets and then he'll say no, and I just eat the cost of the ticket. Somebody said something to me last night at home about they were going to watch a show, and I said, don't watch it. I I didn't go in their room, see if they watched it. See, there's a cost to this. Anybody that's been up here knows. It's really weighty. And so I have to know this is his temple. And I have to know he wants to flow through my temple But I have to make sure that I steward it. And so if those negative thoughts come, I have to know what to do with them. If I do not know what to do with them, I better have help. I better have help available readily. I better not say in my little pea brain, they're too busy. I better not say in my, I better make sure that I know who I can call to get that lie extracted. And I better know what's lies. Why would God call you to something and then tell you you're an idiot? Why would God call you to something and say you're no good at it? I mean, please, are we still on that? Like the enemy uses that message all the time. The enemy is always going to say to you, you're no good, that's not truth, compromise. You know, one of the greatest things as temples that we have got to get healing on is people pleasing. Listen, your anointing cannot serve two gods. You can't be nice one day and feel his presence. How many felt his presence in here today? And you can't go over here the next day and open the door to things that you know are not good for you. Right. I don't know what all that is. Right. I didn't make that rule. But he did. Over here is where he tells you what not to do over there. Yes. 
And if I come over here, this just made me think of some real big joy. Someone gave us a huge donation. We're going to get a new camera and it'll move with me. Watch, watch, watch. It'll move with me. It'll do this. It'll do this. Come on. Come on. That's so exciting. Come on. What are those little? It's got a joystick and everything. That's it. Oh, how he loves. <laughs> Let's go to first Peter. Stop that crying. This is my last foundational scripture, okay? First Peter, such a great chapter, chapter 2. It says, come. Do you hear that word? What does come mean? It's an invitation. Did you know everything in God is an invitation? The more of God is because I heard his invitation. And let me help you a little bit. There'll be a no there. Right next to the invitation, you'll have to say no to something or someone. The invitation is, is to come from where you are now. The invitation is to move from where you are now to something different, or he would have said, stay. He would have said, stay where you are and be his living stone. But he didn't. He said, come. That requires movement. Coming, if I said, come over to my house, you couldn't stay at your house. My house is not at your house. <laughs> If I said, come, we're having a pool party. Somebody might show up, bring a towel. Right? That's what he's saying. Where you are now. It's not where he is. But here's the cool part. He said, come as a living stone, not a dead one. Why did he use stone? It's so weird, isn't it? Because stone is it's dead. It's inanimate. Because a living stone, what is a living stone? Think about it. When you think of a stone, is it wimpy? It's solid. Come as a living, solid entity. It says who are continually being assembled. So that tells you, I need his stone. You know, I didn't promise him anything. I didn't promise him he could play the guitar here. Why? Because God had to shape him to fit in the wall we already made. When he came, he was misshapen. And so I had, have you ever seen anybody do a bricklayer? Have you ever seen a bricklayer? Yeah. They have two tools. And they don't care how the brick feels. Because the brick yeah. needs to be chiseled to fit in that hole. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. If I'm worried about the chiseling, I'll never fit in that hole. So see, if you come, it says, ready, basically, to be assembled. You're, you have, you're not, you're pre-chiseled. 
the assembly process means you're not quite there. So the assembler, he's just got two tools. And he chisels you into the shape that fits in the family he made for you. Listen, if you were in the family where your anointing flourished, it would have flourished. Think about Vinton. He's been on everything at every church everywhere. Because why? He was always willing. But see, I've made him own stuff. Because that's his anointing. His apostolic anointing is to own and to lay out a blueprint and get low. Same as mine. It's not about somebody letting you do a bunch of stuff. It's about someone assembling the living part of you. And stones fit together a certain way. You know, we have stone and brick on our house. I was looking at it yesterday, because I'm going to tear some of it out, because, you know, I don't like it, of course. But I was looking at it yesterday, and I was like, you know, this is pretty amazing that someone can take all of these different shaped stones, throw a little mortar in there. What's mortar? It's love. Let me help you. It helps it stick together. And then it's a solid. You can sit on it. You can build a house around it. Come on. Do you see why he wants us assembled together? Because he's trying to build something greater out of your each individual temples. That's why in a corporate anointing, when there's unity happening, even on a small scale, today, I don't know, I feel like we had 100% participation of people actually crying out in praise. And what happened? I mean, I'm 100. Cece didn't feel good up there and her ears were crappy. I'm 100 on it. But she went ahead and praised. We can't let anything hold us back from the prescribed way. Being assembled into a sanctuary for God. For now you serve as a holy priest. Now you may not want to. Listen, part of God's plan is that certain things come in certain packages. Agreed? So when you came to the planet, y'all, everybody had in here had senses, didn't you? Five or so of them. How many are way more acutely aware of others than they are? Right? I'm acutely aware of this taste. Oh, this taste bud thing I've got going on. I've tried to turn that thing off all my life, but it's still there. It needs sweet stuff on it. (laughs) That bitter coffee makes no sense to me. Like, why does anyone even want to smell that? Like, I don't. There's just things I don't understand. And see, but it gives me great joy that I just built a coffee bar in which I will never drink from. With three coffee pots that I will never enjoy. That's God. That's, that is how he wants the body to operate. Wow. He could care less that you don't like coffee. Will you build a coffee bar for the ones you love? Yeah. Translate that. Yeah. Let's get over ourselves. Because yeah. seeing seven little people toddle in there every morning... When they're not even awake and they've got their little pot filler and their little drawer with a perfectly aligned little pods and they got their little fresh beans that grind up in the machine automatically and they've got their other ancient old pot that you have to prepare the night before that I don't understand. That brings them all joy. I will never be drinking of any of those substances. That's the kingdom way. You are not your own. Can I tell you, I have more joy from that than every one of them got up and made me tea in the morning. 
because why? The mass of their joy combined fills me. And that's what he's saying. You're being assembled into something. You're not your own. If you, in this series, I didn't get to even preach anything about it, but in this series on being a temple, if you will discover the value of yourself, you'll want to give something away. You'll understand you're full. You'll understand that you are full. You are full. You are full. You are full. You are full full to overflowing that there's an abundance in you. It needs to have a way to express itself. It needs to get out of you. And it needs to do something for somebody else. It Love needs to be expressed. Love needs to be expressed in a way that costs you something. See, the example of Jesus is that love cost him everything. He lost his Godhead. He lost his life. He lost his physical man. He lost his friends. He lost his father and mother. He lost everything. He gave his own mother away. What part of you don't understand is that God positioned a family for you If it had been your previous family, your anointing would have flourished. Are we perfect around here? I don't even think that's part of the goal. We're all being chiseled. I'm being chiseled. The thing that bumped up against you last week, he's probably chiseling it off the backside of my leg right now. See, when I know I'm a temple, I'm sorry I've cried this whole time. When I know I'm a temple, when I know my identity, you cannot offend me. I'm unoffendable by what he's chiseling on you. And I just have to keep these three verses in mind. I'm coming as a living stone, expecting, expecting some hard blows on some overgrown flesh. Expecting, I don't even need it. Surely look at your physical man. Surely there's something you want a little more chiseled. Anyone? Anyone at all? Let's don't spend more time on a physical problem when the spiritual one exists as well. Come on. That's going to get you that, but you. Such a good message. I'm so excited about this series, aren't you? Um, so I have a little, a word and a little, um, prophetic pointing. I'm going to call it. Is there such a thing as a prophetic pointing? The Holy Spirit was pointing prophetically. Therefore, it's a prophetic pointing. Okay, so a little bit of background. About a week ago, I think it was last Saturday, I had this encounter with the Holy Spirit where I started off as I often do, you know, wondering, am I going to be able to hear? Like every time, it's just every time. Am I going to be able to connect? I don't know. Um, so, and then I was like remembering, oh, you're so close, you're so close, you're in me. So what's the worry, you know? And so then I imagined myself, I started picturing myself walking around in the temple in me. And so I was picturing how I was just walking around these big halls, you know, with these marble columns and the temple. And I was just walking with the Godhead in this temple. And all of a sudden he changed the picture. And instead of walking, I was floating in a boat. I could only see the front little triangle part of the boat, but the temple was filled with water. It was kind of like in Venice, Italy, you know, where the streets are water. And so instead of walking through the temple, I was floating in a boat through the temple and it was, it was my temple and it was beautiful and it was mesmerizing. And I could just lower my hand out of the boat and let it flow through the water. And I was overwhelmed because I was like, wow, I can feel you, Holy Spirit. Like I always want to feel the Holy Spirit, you know, so I can feel you, you know, good your hand feels in water like that. And, and then I saw the sunrise 
inside the temple, like it rose up off the horizon of the water. And I was like, wow, there's sunrises inside the temple. And it was really, really powerful and a beautiful, a beautiful encounter. And then um, the week carried on. And as you know, it was a holiday week and there were just lots of different things we were doing around the new house and then things you do differently just because it's a holiday, you know. And by the end of the week, then I, I would, so this past Saturday, yesterday, I went to spend um, time with the Holy Spirit in preparation for today, and I just, I realized that I hadn't noticed how much tension I had gotten into in that, in the past week. And so what I realized as the Holy Spirit began to, I just started worshiping and, and, uh, you know, crying out to Jesus about how much I want to be his temple and has, have his glory demonstrated in me and be operational in me. And so he started showing me how, um, especially for me, I come, I'm, my history is, is very much was in striving, you know, so I'll works and accomplishment and that kind of stuff. And so sometimes when I'm in a setting where there's lots of tasking to be done, even though I don't choose to switch systems, it's a little bit of a slippery slope for me because I get real close to the same activities that I used to operate in. So it kind of unknowingly can kind of trigger up these different works-based outlooks and different things. It's all very, very subtle, very, very subtle. And so I, I, he was showing me this yesterday, and he was showing me that he took me back to a room that I was in, and it was the room that in uh, from, you've heard about my experience in first grade that when I was in first grade, and I, um, when this injury happened for me, I was um, made to stay in a room out of contact with my family until I agreed to do what they wanted me to do, and so it. I don't even have any recollection of it. It was very traumatizing. And so I was, I think I was in there for like two weeks, like don't get out of bed, no toys, no books, no parents, no nothing. So it was very, very traumatic. And I, I pictured myself there and I was just so focused on the door that led to the room where my people were, you know, that's where I wanted to go out the door, the door I'd come in um, to be, you know, made to stay there. And then I, in this encounter I was having yesterday, though, I realized there was, an, I saw this image of another door in the room, and there was this hand reaching for it, and there was all this light around the door. And so I began, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me, Papa, Jesus, the Godhead, all three of them were talking to me. And so I began to write what he was telling me, and so I'm going to read that to you now. He said, daughter, you were never meant to be your own puppet master. The strings you now pull on to conform and operate in a world so foreign to you were stitched to you out of injury, not design. You've spent your whole life living by these puppet strings. You've spent every commodity, every resource, every ounce of strength within you to master this puppetry. It was an image of me trying to conform using my own you know, managing my own puppet strings to make me operate the way I had been taught to operate, um, to master this puppetry. But it's not you. It is nothing but bondage for you. I never intended you to survive the broken places this way. I never intended you to adopt the tweaking of injury. I never meant for you to be shaped or molded by what came against you. No, I meant for you to find me there. I meant for you to see the hidden door. I meant for you to see my hand reaching to you. I meant for you to enter into the greater thing, the realm of pleasant suffering, the place where harm is redeemed to pave the way for majesty. Here, instead of puppet strings, your heart would be tethered more closely to me. Daughter, these strings still pull on you, growing more painful every day. We must go back. We must go back and find the hidden door once ignored. I long for you to be free of these strings. I long for you to no longer feel their pull, the pain inducing your every move. 
I long for you to be free, free in my design. Free to function in the smooth fluidity of anointing. Free to live naturally. I see you this way. I see you free, moving in fluidity. You see, the oil of anointing is meant for the joints I made in you, not the puppet strings pulling on you. He said, come, take my hand, return to the hidden door. See the light shining beneath it? What lies behind it? What glory shines in this place? What sunrise is awaiting you? So I said, Papa, I know you've shown me the water-filled temple that awaits me. You've shown me the sun rising on a horizon of purity where I am suspended entirely in the water of your spirit. Oh, how the walls of this temple shine so differently no longer cold as they loom over me, but shining with the light of your sun, reflected by the water so perfectly surrounding me. There's no end to this majesty. Endless grace is displayed all around me. Hope speaks with certainty in this place. My eyes are fastened intently on the rising sun in what it will illuminate ahead of me. Cold marble glows instead with golden warmth all around me. I am free, moving without effort, free to let my hands sink into the water around me, to feel it flowing through my fingers, to feel its nourishment gently massaging me. I feel purpose, direction, momentum, taking place in a sea of peace. No striving, no desperation driving me. Simple rest consumes me, holds me, and moves me. I said, oh, Papa, take me to this place. Manifest this reality in my present day. Forgive me for taking up the puppet master task. I see now it was never what you asked. I see now the distortion it has caused, the way it has tainted all you've ever spoken and already given. Wash me clean of its effect. Take me back. Take me back to the hidden door I missed. Show me the place this light shines. Draw my eyes and heart to the invitation embedded within the pain. Give me courage to look away from the threat. Give me strength to endure the noises in that place. Interrupt my normal with a heavenly pause. Take my face in your hands and turn me away from what the pain has to say. Highlight the warmth and steady assurance felt in your embrace. Turn up the volume on the promises they speak. Help me to reach for the hand that awaits me. And so the, just to elaborate a little bit more on what this, the message I was seeing in this word was that there were two doors in that room that place of harm and injury for me, there were two doors. It was the one I, can't, I walked through that was injuring me in the first place. And then there was this hidden door. And now I walked back out the same door that harmed me. But it went, because I walked back through that door to get out, it, in that process, I was tethered with puppet strings. So that represented that you learn from your lessons, right? Well, I will never act that way again because that will cost me this thing. And so what this was an image of in that moment of injury and harm, there are two doors. There's the one just, you know, yield to the injury, yield to the lie, yield to whatever it was that's harming you that actually creates, um, uh, restricts you. It puts chains on you. Those, those, that type of bondage that we find ourselves living in even years and years later. But in that same place of injury, there's a hidden door where you access what he was showing me was my natural would be to live in this place of this water filled temple. You know, and he was, it was such the opposite of an image of trying to, of how I've spent my whole life trying to make this puppet. Like I didn't, I know in this, in this image, I no longer operated out of my core being who I was made to be. I operated out of how all the strings that have been attached to me. And I had been shown how to operate, you know. 
And so this concept of a hidden door, I think a couple of thoughts that came to me is that, um, you know, we in our heal, inner healing journey and our process, we are quick and we welcome um, going to those places for, you know, the initial healing. But then the more healing you get, you can kind of feel like I'm good. I'm good there. I don't really need to go back and revisit that pain. But Tisa said it last week that there's more. There's oftentimes more in that place of injury that we could learn from, we could receive from him. And so I, I saw that what I had done is I had received some healing, but I've still been operating with the puppet strings attached. I'm like, okay, I'm good. You cut a few strings. I'm good. But now I'm going to go and operate for you, Holy Spirit. I want to bring this. And I wrote this line. I'm sorry for trying to make this puppetry an offering for you. And I think this, this spoke to what has been spoken about all day today, really, and is very often in this house, that how intent God is for us to be truly free. You know, he, he's really just not okay with us being partially free. His heart is intent on us being completely, completely healed and free. And so he wants us to be willing to go back to that place and this, the way this happens, of course, is not always just in a perfect, you know, pre-planned sozo. Sometimes it happens when you're interacting with somebody and that injury comes up in your face. And so we have to recognize that's an opportunity to, to pick a different door. And so instead of going through the, the same door you've always gone through, where you walk out in response to reactively and self-protection and, you know, all those ways, ways we prevent being harmed again, there's a different door in that moment that he wants to show us and lead us to more freedom. And so after this aspect of my encounter with him, he was reminding me of something he told me um, last Sunday that was just really, really loud in my spirit when Tisa talked about Jeremiah 7. And it connected to a story in Nehemiah for me that where Nehemiah is rebuilding the wall, which we had been on. You know, so I wanted to share this little nugget with you and tell you what I'm hearing is the, the prophetic emphasis or the pointing to. So if you remember in Jeremiah 7, uh, um, God says, stand in the gate of God's temple and preach this message. Right. And of course, you might want to go back and listen to last Sunday's message again after taking all of this in to context. But so stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim this word. And he basically went on to say, you're desecrating the temple. You're saying this is God's temple. You're entering it and saying this is a house of worship, but you're actually desecrating it. And I mean, you know how it can be in the Old Testament sometimes. It can sound kind of harsh. But I like to hear the message in it and, and recognize that there's ways we're doing things just like idol worship. We don't have carved images that we light a candle for maybe every day, but we are worshiping other little G gods in ways that we don't recognize as idol worship, right? So it's the same thing. So I knew the Holy Spirit was have had a message here about look, and Tisa preached on it, about look at your temple and look at what kind of activity is going on in your temple and your and are you are you really here to worship or are you doing things that actually are um, sabotaging your worship and are actually desecrating to this temple that's really meant to be set apart for me? Okay, so that was, uh, I have to pull out this one line a little further down in Jeremiah 7. He says one of the ways that he's, I, he's pointing to people and saying, this is what you're doing. You, you're clinging to lies and illusions that are worthless. Do you, don't, do you think you can steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and chase after other gods and still expect me to protect you? Do you think all it takes is for you to run back to me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we're safe now? Okay, this is a little bit deep, so you got to follow with me. There's a little connection here. So this line about as if people are just running back to the house of God and saying, we're safe now. Right, and that basically was pointing to these religious rituals and calling it good. Okay, so we jump over to that was Jeremiah seven, Nehemiah six. Now there's a point in Nehemiah six where you remember they 
have they've been working on the wall and all these people, you know, Tobiah and Sam Ballot had come trying to distract him and get him pulled away from the wall. And, and that's when he says, you know, why would I come down from doing this? So four times in this chapter, um, Tobiah and Simbala invite Nehemiah to come out as a friend and say, come and meet with us. You know, stop what you're doing. We're friends. We're on your side. Come and meet with us. Four times they do that. And he recognizes what's happening. And he's like, no, I'm not stopping. Then the fifth time he's approached with a letter and he's basically slandered in this letter and says, and is told that um, there's rumor going on that you're doing all of this because you plan to rebel against the king of Persia. And we know this must be true. So don't you think we better get together and talk about this? Because you're going to be in trouble, basically. That's okay, my paraphrase. So it's a different, uh, a different type of trying to get him to come and talk, where they were suggesting this um, people-pleasing thing, where other people think this about you. Don't you think you better stop and pay attention to it? But then... He, he, he shoots that down, right? Says, nope, don't even, I'm not even going to engage with you about that. That's a lie. Done, done with you. So the sixth time, it says in Scripture, I'm going to read it in the voice, a little later, the very next line, okay, after the fifth attempt is shot down, a little later I went to see Shemaiah, Delaiah's son, and Mehetabal's grandson. I don't know how to say those names, but Okay who was shut up inside his house. So I went to see Shemaiah, who was shut up in his house. Shemaiah says, it's not safe here. Let us leave and go to God's house inside the temple and shut the doors. People are coming to kill you, and they will come at night. So Nehemiah goes there, right? He went. It doesn't say they came to him. He went there. So that tells me he expected this to be a prophetic word that was on his side, right? God is prophesying something and we need to, he wants to hear it. And so he goes to hear it. And so the prophetic message that he is told is that I have advanced knowledge that you're about to be killed. I have advanced knowledge that you are in danger and I have a plan to bring you to safety. So follow me and we'll go to God's temple. Okay. Well, think about what was happening here, if you dig a little deeper and look at it a little closer, Nehemiah wasn't a priest. He wasn't, by law, allowed to enter the temple. So they were saying, hey, it doesn't we've got these laws where you're not supposed to even be in that, that far into the temple. You know, you're not supposed to enter that room. But it's okay because I said it was okay, and you need to get to safety, so go ahead and enter the temple. And so this is the connecting point for me where it was just the highlight for the Holy, from the Holy Spirit. In Jeremiah 7, it says, you think you can just run to the temple and be safe and say, I'm safe here. In Nehemiah 6, the guy's saying, hey, you're not safe. Run to the temple. You'll be safe there. Okay? So there's a connection there about what was being highlighted in Jeremiah 7. And so I've been trying to search out what that was. Like, what is the deeper message here? And so continuing on, Thankfully, Nehemiah in verse 11 says, why would a man in my position run for his life? And why would a person like me use the temple to save his life when such contact with God would surely kill me? I refuse to go into the temple under such circumstances. Verses 12 and 13 says, while I was speaking these words, Nehemiah says, while I was speaking these words, I realized God had not sent him to me. God would never tell me to break his laws. Shemaiah's prophecy was inspired by the money of Tobiah and Sanballat. After hearing his message, they thought I would be scared and thus vulnerable to sin, and they hoped to use such a lapse in behavior to discredit me. So this is what the correlation that I'm seeing here is this is what happens when those puppet strings get pulled on us, right? They are The puppet strings are prophesying something to you, saying, ooh, that person just got a tone with you. You know what's going to happen next. You're not safe, and so you better do so-and-so in order to protect yourself, right? That's what all those old puppet strings say. So it's the same thing. It says, hey, go ahead and act this way, 
that's actually going to desecrate your temple. But it's worth it because you need to be safe. And isn't it interesting that this, what occurred to me is that there are basically five times in this chapter that the the Tobiah and Sanballat tried to distract him. But they were more direct approaches. They were like, he knew who sent the letters. They were saying, you know, this is us. Come be friends with us. We want to talk to you. By the time it gets to this time, which is the sixth time, this is someone who's supposedly on his side, supposedly giving have a word from God, right? So there's an assumption that he wouldn't suggest that you do anything wrong. There's an assumption that a man of God wouldn't tell you to break God's laws, right? And so I propose that that's the same thing that happens to us. When our protectors come up, they're like, I'm on your side. I've been protecting you this whole time, and you know that this is what we need to do. You can trust me. It doesn't matter that what I say goes against what you just heard in the message on Sunday. You better do it. You better do it. You know, we're, you don't have the same um, defenses up when someone's speaking to you that you think is on your side, right? So if a stranger came up to us and told us something that would be des- basically desecrating your temple, We'd be like, no, that's ridiculous. But if a protector came up, somebody who said, I'm on your side, I know you well. I know how much this hurts you in the past, and I know that you don't want to be hurt in this way again, then we lis- we tend to listen, right? And so Jeremiah 7 is saying, hey, stand in the gate of your temple and look at what's going on. He's, he's inviting us to see what is really happening, happening there. One extra thing, just in case you don't believe me yet, there's a cool little fun nugget here. At the beginning of chapter 6, Nehemiah is saying, once again, we found that our progress had been reported to our enemies. Um, They had heard that under my leadership, the wall had been rebuilt. Not one gap remained, parentheses, though the doors still had to be hung on the gates. Now, I've always wondered why that detail was put in here. Because at the end of the chapter, they're like, we're done. The wall's, the wall's complete. But they included that for some reason, that, okay, technically the wall is rebuilt, but there's still no doors on the gates yet at the point in time that this happens. So I was just wondering about that. And I was looking for this prophetic message in here. And I decided to look up the naming of the, the meaning of the names for who gave this prophecy to Nehemiah, right? The Shemaiah guy is the one who said, you're not safe, come with me. Take up, you know, refuge in the temple. Well, it was interesting that in the scripture, it does list who Shemaiah's father was and who his grandfather was. And so I looked up the means of the grandfather and the father. Now, um, Shemaiah, the name Shemaiah means herd of Yahweh. And I read that it's an extremely popular name in the, in the Bible, mostly of priests, Levites, and prophets. So I just want to propose that that represents a very common um, prof, someone who prophesies, okay? Um, and, the, you know, of course, there may be other facts and meanings and all of this. This is just what I feel like the Holy Spirit was highlighting for us right now. So the father's name, however, is Deleah. And it was so interesting because it says the meaning of this name is the poor of the Lord or the door of Yah, and Yah has delivered. So I just had this word about the hidden door in those moments that's available to us, and this name means door of Yah, and Yah has delivered. I dug a little deeper. The root words in there, there's a verb in that word that means to hang, Remember at the beginning, we have not hung the doors yet. And it means to hang. It means to hang a door, to elaborate a little more, um, usually between a reservoir of plenty and a place of need. So it, it, the name is literally talking about a door that on the other side of the door is a place of plenty. It's a reservoir of plenty. But on one side, the other side of the door is a place of need. 
So that sounds like the, the picture, you know, that I'm in this place of injury, I've got the one door that's a place of need. I've, I've got a lack. I've got something has been taken from me. I've been harmed in some way. It's a place of need. I could go back out through that door. Or if there's this hidden door, I, there's a reservoir of plenty. Some other words mean low, weak, poor, and thin. And, of course, door. And the... I just had to include this part, but one of the def- part of the definition for the word door um, said that through this entrance, folks would travel bearing gifts, wisdom, and news from the world at large, much like a bucket from a well. And so the word can also mean bucket. And so, it, again, it just points to there's so much goodness available on the other side of this door, you know, through this door. And so I also read that this name Delea in Scripture, I think there were maybe four five people maybe in the whole Bible with this name. But one of the people with this name were um, was a head of a family just prior to the wall being built. But after the exile, when the um, Israelites went back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, they were a head of a family, but they couldn't prove their lineage after exile. So, you know, after exile, they were not they were returning, and so they want to do everything completely proper, and so you could only serve in certain roles if you were truly a Levite, so you had to have documentation and proof you were truly a Levite, that kind of thing. So these this guy with this name was someone who could not prove their lineage, but yet had made the journey and was on site, okay? So I'm want to propose to you that this was somebody who had experienced a level of rejection, had been deemed unqualified to do what they wanted to do. So this is just the prophetic picture I'm seeing, okay? The prophecy from Shemaia came as a result of Delea's experience, is what I'm saying. Delea's experience was, we have a suggestion at least, that he could have been one of these guys who had experienced rejection who'd said you're not good enough basically to be in the temple, who experienced a type of injury and possibly, quite likely, had had developed a lot of bitterness. And so I want to propose that Delea went through the door of injury and had the puppet strings on them. So by the time his son was prophesying, he was prophesying really for the enemy and not for God. So that's like our, our injuries where the puppet strings are saying, hey, you know, you better back that person off because they're about to hurt your feelings. You know, those things that come up in self-protection. So what would have happened if Delea had gone through a different door in that moment of injury for him than his son Delea, I mean, the son of Shemaia may have been, you know, would have been prophesying for God and not against God's call and purpose on Nehemiah. And so I think there is just this, this emphasis about the door on our gates. We've rebuilt the wall. The whole, the gate is there. And obviously in Jeremiah 7, it says, stand at the gate. What are you seeing? I want to propose these things. Stand at the gate and see how your door is hung. Stand at the gate and see which door you've hung there. Or have you hung the door of injury that is going to attach those puppet strings to you? Or have you hung the door that's the hidden door where the Holy Spirit wants to bring you gifts and wealth and wisdom and all sorts of healing where you operate fluidly? So, of course, as I said, I hope everybody listens, re-listens to this message, but also re-listen to last Sunday's because you can hear the Holy Spirit speaking on this topic, just like Tessa's word at the beginning about, you know, surrendering your humanity and being willing to be human with him where you enter to the joy of salvation that way. It's the same as the pleasant suffering. If you just modify yourself and fight against your humanity by operating with puppet strings, then you're going to be missing out on the joy of your salvation and all that he wants to bring. So Papa, we just say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you for your intricate plan and the all of the eloquent and fun and powerful ways that you speak to us and highlight for us and just call out to us with that invitation that says, come, come and be the living stone. Come and be formed and fitted into this thing I'm building, this temple, 
So we just thank you for all the ways that you speak. And I ask that you would make today's message really personal for each person and that you would reinforce it, that you would protect it, that you would bring them dreams and visions and conversations and scriptures and all sorts of things to make it really personal and manifest into something in their present day. And so we thank you and we say yes to your invitation tonight or today. And we love you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's welcome Cheryl. Yeah. Man, so good. I'm already so excited for this series. Um, it's really cool because um, as we get ready for the wealth mindset, Lenny has done a lot of research on wealthy people in the Bible. And one of the things that she found was just the expenses that um, it costs to build a temple. And I don't want to give anything away. Uh, but let's just say no expense was spared. It was very extravagant temple. And, and so then I started thinking, you know, what was it like to experience that temple? To walk in and, and see this extravagance, just gold and stones and just like to be able. I wonder what that was like for people to receive being able to go into that sort of temple and so, um, and so then to think that that temple where no spence was spared was just a shadow for our temples where no spent, no expense was spared, where he gave his only, he gave everything to us and realizing that our temples are meant to be experienced. And so one of the ways that people get to experience our temple and that truth that no ex no expense was spared was through the act of giving. Through giving, we actually give people an insight of, hey, come and experience this God. Come and experience all that he has. Let me show you. And so really, really cool. I'm excited for this series. But as we go into giving, realize that that is a way that people, you actually get to show people what he's like um, and just the beauty of the temple that he's built inside of you comes comes through giving so we've got a couple ways you can do that today we've got our box back there you can put cash or checks in an envelope notate on the envelope how you're giving um if you want to give electronically we've got our website it's onelifeok.com let's stand and do our offering degree papa all abundance is in your hands I say my heart is filled with gratitude today for all that you provide while I seek first the kingdom in my life. I say today that I will steward well what you put into my hands this year. I will seek wisdom for the abundance you are pouring out into my hands this year. This is a year of expansion and growth. So I speak to the north, south, east, and west and say release what is the king's. Release what is meant for the kingdom. Release what is meant for growth. Release, release, release. I speak for the resources to be unlocked. I speak to any blockage to be unlocked. I speak to any finances that are imprisoned to be unlocked. Unlock, unlock, unlock. I speak to creativity to be unhindered. I speak the favor of God and man over my life this year. I will use my creativity to expand. Creativity, arise, arise, arise. Papa, I say make way, make way for the king this year in my life and the life of my tribe through your abundance. There's more with you in 22. So I just bless this word today. I seal it all up, all the seeds that you place on us. I thank you that we are learning to be your temple and yours alone. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>